now let's move swiftly on to our first session. Now, this is a TED, TED style talk, and what we're going to be focusing on is the transition from hybrid warfare to hyperwar, involving some of our leading future thinkers, I'm pleased to say, who'll be coming up on stage shortly. Now, they really specialize in harnessing the potential of artificial intelligence, developing future capabilities from concept to combat, and enhancing our future technological connectivity. Thank you very much. Now, I'm just uh, dealing with a little technical incident here with uh, one of the microphones. Um, if it, I'm going to introduce you, Keith. Keith Deer, Dr. Keith Deer, Director of Artificial Intelli Intelligence Innovation at Fujitsu. So if you could say a few words, and we can check whether the microphone's actually working. Well, we have a green light, so hopefully. Um, sorry, so you want me to... Uh, yeah, so to just, just say a few words and just tell me a little bit about um, how you're working with an intersection of AI and human psychology. Yeah, so I, I was an 18-year intelligence officer in, in, in the RAF. I um, went through the fellowship scheme, as many of the people did here, which is a, a great privilege. I did uh, MA in terror and counter-terror, and then um, later a PhD in experimental psychology. And, and from there on in, I've been looking constantly at the intersection of, of AI and human psychology, so the relative strengths and limitations of each. Now in the private sector and a reservist for 601, I lead on science and tech for 601, and I run a thing called the Centre for Cognitive and Advanced Technologies at Fujitsu, which again looks at well, how, do we, um, how do we get the most from man and machine in making decisions. Fantastic. Well, the mic seems to be working reasonably well, so uh, let's move on. I'd love to introduce now Dr. Will Roper. Now, Do Will, um, you are also um, uh, 601 Honorary Group Captain, as is uh, Professor Adam Beaumont. Uh, so uh, welcome to you both. Uh, really great to have uh, three uh, representatives from 601 uh, Squadron here. Um, so, Will, tell me a little bit about your role, your long-standing role in developing new tech for the Pentagon, because you're, you're really a digital transformation and next-generation air dominance expert, would you say? How, how do you see you know, this discussion? What do you want to get out of this discussion here today? Sure, no, thank you. It's great being here with everyone, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, wherever you are. Uh, no one is an expert on technology or innovation, so I will, I'll set that aside, but I've enjoyed being a part of it. And I guess my, my focus has really been on trying to focus on technologies and processes that give agility. That's really the change that I see the world going through, is that uh, in the past, you really focused on products. And you know, everyone in this room is very familiar and, and transversant with operationalizing products. But you saw first in the world of software that more and more technology went into not the product, but actually the process that makes the product. Agile happened and DevSecOps happened. And now software looks more like an agile process that you can point at anything can deal with changes in markets and customer demand. And the same thing is now happening to hardware because of digital engineering. And so the things that I was really passionate about were, were things that made things better. And what I see happening in the future is, is really the ability to make anything with agile processes where hardware and software are no longer different for innovators. And if you're not ready for that as an Air Force or a Space Force, then you've lost. You, you won't get to the fight because you're, you're so far outside of an OODA loop that an adversary can bring to bear that you won't have the dominance that you need even on day one. And that, that's really been my focus in public sector and what I continue to work on in the private sector. Well, looking forward to delving into that in more detail uh, very soon. And just briefly, let me introduce uh, properly Professor Adam Beaumont. So, Adam, you are an angel investor, CEO, and a digital entrepreneur. Just tell me very briefly about some of the most exciting projects you're involved in right now. Uh, okay, so just, just, just going back a little bit, um, just to sort of frame that. Um, originally, I was an academic. I'm a scientist, a chemist. Um, and that, uh, that I, I, this was the 90s, so this was the start of the internet. I, I quickly fell in love with the internet more than science, I think, at the time. And I then, 
um, transferred to an organization that would let me explore the internet, and that, that was what was the Defense Evaluation Research Agency. Um, so I built some of the UK's first cyber teams. And very soon after that, I, I built a dot-com startup, uh, which is now a group of telecoms companies that I run today. The, the key thing that is, is, I guess, my mantra, my, my, my focus, is that we do not build sector-specific technology. We build the underlying infrastructure, uh, which lies as the foundation for other specialists, software platforms, other digital companies, innovators, AI, to sit on top of. So uh, if I was to describe myself, I'd describe myself as an internet plumber. And one of the things I probably want to talk a little bit more of um, today is some, some of the hidden risks behind this, this communication layer that we now take for granted, which can be used um, both uh, as, as, a, as, a, as an opportunity but also as a threat. Uh, and it's the fundamental infrastructure which we've now been play, applying digital sanctions over the top of. So uh, in, in, terms of the, in terms of what we're involved with at the moment, we are heavily involved in building infrastructure to support some of the efforts in Ukraine. I can tell you some about that, but not an awful lot about it. But I hopefully share as much as I can. Great. Well, thanks very much. Well, let me uh, go back to you, Keith, because a bit earlier today uh, we were discussing, you know, the, the whole framing of this discussion from um, hybrid to hyper war. Ultimately, um, is this all about learning how to win? How, what's your take on this? Yeah, so we, we were talking about this before um, the conference started and preparing for the panel. Um, what does it mean to go from hybrid war to, to hyper war? Um, first thing is you, you could probably contest whether hybrid war was really anything new. It was, um, you know, so you're talking about sedition and subversion and sabotage and many things that are as timeless as warfare. Um, I think what we're really talking about is learning how to win in a new environment. You know, learning how to win warfare is, is timeless. What we're learning now is how we win where the conventional element is back in, which we should always have been preparing for. But I think hyper-warfare is, is just, I think the framing of the talk is designed to give us a laser focus on, on the kind of next generation of conflicts rather than those that came before. And, and, you know, one of the things I've been talking about passionately for a long time is that we in the UK needed a checkmate in the Royal Air Force. USAF has checkmate, which is their centre that came up with multiple kind of battle-winning concepts, saying how do we harness technology to win more effectively? And I think the Royal Air Force for a long time was kind of following doctrinal trends, concepts, ideas of how to win that came out of the US. And I was really pleased to find in preparing for this that we now do have a checkmate in the UK. Um, but I, th I think, so I think that that's what we're talking about. When we move from hybrid war to hyper war, we're, we're learning how to win in an environment that we had not focused on in perhaps as intently as we should for the last decade. Would you say that's the, the same take that you have, Adam? Um, I think, yeah, just, just, just to sort of to add to, to, to add to what Keith's saying, I think, I think that, 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 that win is understanding the theatre in which we play and and we are moving more into a cyber domain. And some of that is, is short-term tactical, uh, immediate offensive or defensive cyber. Uh, but there's also an awful lot that we have and should be doing uh, in terms of uh, preparing our infrastructure uh, to be as resilient as possible. And, and I mean that in, in several ways. One, uh, making sure that we can share information with ourselves. Uh, making sure that closed regimes don't control the communication space uh, so they can control the message or the, or the, or the, or the fake news. Um, and, and, I, and I think that we need to make sure uh, that we are building mechanisms to support, um, for example, Ukraine, uh, um, where, where we're seeing um, the securing of the, th of the communications theatre by attacking the mobile network inf infrastructure. I think we saw that very, very early on. And we're starting to see new types of technology, such as low Earth orbit satellites um, and, and satellite connectivity being um, the, the fix-it, as it were, for, for that broken fiber infrastructure, for that broken communications infrastructure. So we probably saw some of the, the, um, the stories of Starlink shipping antenna to Ukraine. Again, um, you, the Ukrainians, very, very bright, capable people, they're saying, we, we don't need help technically, we just need the tools. And, and one of the things that we've seen is, for example, making sure that they can maintain uh, a mobile network infrastructure um, in, in such a difficult time. And that's, that's unprecedented. Um, we've not seen um, this, this level of, of communications infrastructure stay intact uh, in, in, this, in these kind of settings before. So I think that the win is moving into different technology sectors. 
I, th I think, uh, we, when we talked about this before, I think fundamentally what this means is about learning to win in domains that we hadn't thought about as yeah. closely as we should, but also developing doctrinal concepts at the speed of technological change. We spend a lot of time, you know, Will's papers, some of the, some of the ones um, like There Is No Spoon, for example, looking at how we might use simulated and synthetic environments to keep up and constantly innovate in new tactics. And for me, that's, that's what we're talking about. When we talk about learning to win, we're talk talking about developing doctrinal concepts that harness new domains, new technologies, new approaches at the same speed at which the technology is developing. And, I, and I'm not sure that's the thing that I think we really need to learn is how, how do we innovate in the war fighting concepts at a speed that constantly harnesses the changes that technology is introducing to the domain. And you know, the work that Adam does is brings the technology and the, the challenge to the audience, I think, is okay, but how do you, how, that, that's gonna change your war fighting concept on an almost daily basis as a new innovation is, perhaps not daily, but certainly monthly basis as new innovations are brought in. How do we evolve the way we fight to keep up with the speed of technological change? And I think Will has kind of a large part of the answer with that with um, some of the papers uh, that you've published. Maybe an answer, but not the solution. I mean, I, I think I thought about the term hyper warfare when I was flying here this morning. And you know, th these buzzwords take on a life of their own in governments. But, and I try to think, what, is it, what will it really mean? What's the next thing that will feel like a different thing on the battlefield? And, for me, it's, and I don't think this is widely understood, and I've thought about this a lot since leaving government, is that now that this thing called digital transformation is happening, which is really the fact that we can model reality with a level of fidelity, that we can design things, test things, train for things, without having to do them in the physical world. So this metaverse concept is now becoming possible for things. That's what lets AI get out of the Internet of Things into the physical world. So you probably know like AlphaGo Zero, you know, beat the world's Go champion about a decade before I think most experts thought. And maybe that shocked you, maybe it didn't because it's a game. You may not know that AI was a big part of Team New Zealand's America's Cup win, uh, using AI to competitively sail. Not only did it learn to sail better than people sail, but it actually learned to sail in a fundamentally different way, a new way. It, it, it went beyond human logic of sailing, and now human teams learn from it, the same way that humans learn from AlphaGo Zero how to play chess and go. I think, I think the new thing is that war, warfare can be gamified. Once you understand the physics of it, and you can model that, you can gamify it, so AI can understand it. And we should expect those same moments where AI eclipses our logic and it becomes an integral part of the battlefield at a time constant we can't join. I think that will be uncomfortable for everyone, especially for policymakers. And, it, and no one will be exempt. Even though it's technology, how do you train for it? How do you regulate it? I think a thing to note there is that, that speed of technological change that we talked about, it was a decade before people thought it would happen when Gary Kasparov lost at chess. It was probably significantly more than a decade. We've had a year of large language models and image generation networks um, um, produced by all of the major tech companies. And if you look at the forecasting tournaments around the world, even the most evangelistic technological forecasters thought those things were further out than they have proved yeah. to be. We are consistently underestimating the speed of technological change. You know, in 2010, there was no, no AI ML anywhere, really, outside of the lab. Um, now it's everywhere, in all of your phones, everything. And if we'd been on stage talking about how AI was going to revolutionize warfare a decade ago, we'd have been laughed at by this audience. In fact, we probably wouldn't have been invited to speak. And yet, you even now, we're saying, well, okay, how does it change warfare? And you get an awful lot, well, it doesn't really change any of the fundamentals. Well, I think it, I think it really does. I think it, it does change how we make decisions. It, it changes the speed at which warfare is fought. It changes the freedoms that we have to operate. And I, I just don't think our warfighting concepts yet are keeping up with the number of different domains we need to consider um, and the profundity of the changes that it means for, for how we make decisions, which in the end is what humans do. We make decisions. We anticipate the future and we make decisions. It's been the thing that separated us from animals for well, throughout human history and now we have te technology and machines that can do it so um, what's your take on this Adam you talk you say that you're an internet plumber essentially um, are you are you already seeing real divides between different militaries in in the way that they're approaching AI and their um, willingness to embrace it and the complexity that that presents I, I think that we're starting to see some, some, some really um, positive flow, actually, in terms of the way uh, that technology is being embraced by the military. Um, my feeling is, is it used to be very much um, vendor-led, 
uh, framework-led. And, and that meant that it was very hard to, to look at how we um, interface some of the smaller innovative companies. They don't carry clearance. Um, they don't have any kind of accreditations. Um, so they don't really quite fit, but this, but this is where the innovation happens, and it, it, come, it spins out of the universities, it spins out of startups, and, and what we're seeing is, is, an, is an appetite to use some of these framework providers as, as, as better caring aggregators of some of this tech without trying to take it over, um, and I think that that's a really positive thing. The other, the other, the other point is, um, for example, one of the pieces of work that we've been doing uh, at RF Leeming uh, over the past couple of years has been to build an innovation lab. Uh, and this innovation lab uh, is providing the opportunity, for example, for, for, um, for signals, uh, for engineers to, to use technology, not necessarily um, with a, a, a look at warfare, but to be able to innovate in a safe space, whether that's Internet of Things sensors to allow them to, to grow um, vegetables for their family on, on base better, but you know, a quality of life thing. But it's, it starts as that, it, and, and the, 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 I guess the, the main uh, thing here is, is that we are starting to see um, pockets of safe innovation, and that it's okay to fail, and it's okay to try things, uh, rather than we, we must buy vendor X, and that's our solution. Can I offer a yes but, Adam, in the spirit sure, of absolutely. us being more interesting by disagreeing? Um, <laughs> as somebody who's at a large tech company, one of those kind of ven vendors, uh, I, I think it's the e defense gets the ecosystem of in industrial companies that it contracts for. Um, and right now, the ITTs coming out of defense are not putting significant money behind the technologies of tomorrow. And consequently, the large tech companies tend not, therefore, to innovate in that space. So everybody's waiting for the other person to come forward with it. And I think if you contracted for outcomes, something that John Mickelson and 601 colleague in the audience today uh, and I wrote, if you contract for outcomes, we want to achieve this. And if you develop the warfighting concepts together with industry, industry will build the solutions you need and begin to anticipate the future. If you tell industry to wait for multi-million pound ITTs, which are yesterday's technology tomorrow, that's what we'll optimise for, because it's what you're paying us and incentivising us to do. So I, I agree on the SME's point, but I think Defence's wider industrial ecosystem isn't there because they don't want to innovate. It's there because that's the incentive that is being provided to them. Well, what would you say the dangers are in this hesitancy? Well, I, th I think the danger is that the private sector shows a lot of the potential solutions for government. I certainly, working at McKinsey now, I get to see a lot of companies that are outside of defense, and there are a lot of solutions that could be farmed and brought in, and, and the team I support does a lot of that. But inside of government, the ratio of people who can say no to yes is orders of magnitude greater than the private sector. And that's an extinction factor for almost every good idea. And I, you know, I dealt with that extinction factor. It takes, it takes leaders with passion to punch through that extinction factor and open up the potential of what the private sector will always trailblaze ahead of the public and make it happen in government. But if you take nothing else, if you take nothing else from this talk away, at least from me, if, if you're still, if you're serving in a government it's, it's the focus that the private sector has right now on technologies that make other technologies that is the thing you've got to wake up and harness. It, it, it's, like, it's, it is a, it's, it's like an acceleration term, and you're still dealing with velocity. Right? It is going to accelerate the pace of everything. Just like the government got left behind in software, it's about to get left behind in everything. And if, and if leaders with passion do not break down the barrier and extinguish the extinction factor, there'll eventually be a point where governments can't catch up. They'll be fighting yesterday's war with yesterday's systems against yesterday's threats when it's tomorrow's threat that they face on the battlefield. And I do everything in my power to, you know, to stop that. But I think it's that ratio of no's to yes that, that really makes it tough to get anything started in government. Once you start something, you can keep momentum. It's the starting that's hard. How mindful of this were you, Keith, when writing the government's integrated review? So, so we, we, one of the things you really struggle to do in government is come up with clearly prioritised lists, because the minute you put a priority one, half a government, including ministers, get very angry that that's number one, and you know, they're not number one, and so forth. What we were able to do is make the first chapter of the integrated review on science and tech advantage. 
And I think we were the first national security glo strategy globally to say that the, the really, in definitive terms, national security advantage is firstly about systemic competition, so it's about defence, but it's much wider, and it's about the competition through science and tech and the constant search for advantage, and that, that again means harnessing the private sector. But I think it also means a fundamentally geo-economic approach about thinking about the closeness of the state uh, and the private sector and how you innovate together. And so we, we were looking at reframing both how we think about economics internationally and how we think about science and technology as, as the key vectors through which the national security challenges would emerge. Um, so I think we signal that. And one of the things I'm really proud of is I th think you see that rippling through government now. There isn't a department that isn't looking at how we achieve science and tech advantage. I mean, from education through to DIT, all of them, it's, it's the priority. And I, I think, yeah, I think we really did drive that home. So. And Adam, are you seeing evidence of that innovation rippling through government? I think I think we're starting to see some 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 um, some green shoots of this. Um, you know, again, part of the review was was um, was collaboration, uh, and uh, notably we have um, uh, the Diana project, uh, which is kicking off. Um, notably with with Estonia as, as as kind of part of the UK uh, part of the lead, uh, and also there's a UK Estonia tech partnership, which is also focusing on cyber. Um, so we're starting to see those kind of collaborations. I mean, those are just a couple of examples, and I'm particularly Estonia-focused because I'm one of their consuls. Um, so I, that's what I'm seeing. Uh, but um, those collaborations are key, and to keep those agile. Um, so that's kind of part of what uh, that whole agenda is pushing. Okay, thank you. Now, we've got some questions, I think, coming through uh, from the audience. Um, and uh, just uh, while I'm... Just scanning them. I'd just like to ask you, Will, uh, you know, in what way do you feel um, that um, what's happened in Ukraine, as far as the conflict is concerned, that it's kind of really um, moved the dial in terms of this discussion we're having right now? Well, I mean, the, the, the events that we're watching are, are horrible. I mean, who thought we would see this? But I was talking with uh, a few people before the event, and they were saying that you know, Ukraine was a real wake-up call. And I've been thinking about that. And I, if it's a wake-up call for you thinking about the future of warfare, it's, it's your wake-up call 20 years ago. Right? The, the things that we are seeing on that front that are, that are horrible atrocities, if you think about them from, like, foreseeable, foreseeable issues on the battlefield, these were issues that were foreseen 20 years ago. And now the future is happening faster. So I don't think it's too late if you're waking up now, but, but I can't stress enough, the pace of technology is accelerating even faster. So the next wake-up call will be a lot sooner than the last one. And the urgency that we need to keep up with the pace of technology is just simply, it's just simply lacking from what I can see. Keith, you're nodding your head. Yeah, because I think we... Well, this is something we talked a lot about in the review. There are a number of specific anticipatable contingencies around the world, things that we could have predicted might well happen, and if they did, we needed to be ready for. A war between Ukraine and Russia would have been pretty near the top of that list. You, know, you can think of other examples, war with Iran, war with China uh, over Taiwan. These are, these are things that we very much hope won't happen, but you have to be prepared for in order to deter them um, and in order to be ready if they do. So it, it shouldn't be a wake-up call because we knew. So if you hadn't war-gamed those, planned for them, and built the technological solutions in advance, why not, is the question. So I, I was nodding because I, I think that's, that's fundamentally right. And also, um, there's a slight plug, but it is relevant. I published something in the Wavell Room this morning looking at lessons from Ukraine. And I, my real worry is that we, we have a tendency to look at conflicts and see what we want to see. So the, the Telegraph, Daily Telegraph, had published an article last week talking about how Ukraine demonstrated the overwhelming case for crewed aircraft in 2040. Now, that may or may not be true. My personal view is that, that we won't have crewed aircraft in 2040. Um, but whether we do or not, it's not a lesson from Ukraine. It, that is an attempt to see what you want to see in order to draw the conclusion you wanted to draw. And I, I really worry that we, one, see it as a wake-up call when it shouldn't have been, and then secondly, immediately look to find the lessons that justify what we wanted to do anyway. And I, I, I really worry about that, and I think it's important that people, that we all understand our own biases as we draw lessons from these conflicts. Well, that segues very nicely to a question from Tim Robinson from Aerospace Magazine. What are the main lessons for aerospace power professionals from Ukraine? 
Well, I, you go first. Well, I, okay, so I, it's, firstly, it's very early. We don't have the, um, any of the like, detailed classified intelligence to make those judgments, certainly not on this stage. Um, I, I would say that there's, there's real value to seeing the, what the Ukraine Air Force has been able to do just by being a force in being. So just the fact that it can continue to get fighter aircraft airborne helps to shape the battlefield. Thinking about how you win um, when you're on the defensive and you don't have uh, the strength that we've relied on in the past. That's a big lesson. I think the value of uncrewed systems, despite being almost criminally underinvested in over the decades, they've still proved absolutely crucial in that conflict. I think that's a clear lesson. Uh, and perhaps investment ought to be proportionate to the effect that they're having. And I think the effectiveness of surface-to-air weapons, something that we uh, perhaps are um, not as heavily invested in as we might be, um, so I think those, and then I think they're also overestimating the enemy. I mean, for me, in early years in air power, in air force training and exercises, we'd kind of put some of these systems, Russian systems, on the map, and they'd be like no-go areas. And actually, we're seeing that there are vulnerabilities even to those systems. So nothing is absolute is another key lesson. There is always, there is always a way, um, and it's about being able to think fast in your adversary to, to degrade them. Okay. A lot of what we called, you know, anti-access area denial strategies, we're just seeing play out, right? The Fragility of logistics, fragility of comm, fragility of, of navigation solutions, the potency of, of cost imposition, like you know, like unmanned, uncrewed systems, right? Imposed cost. We're just seeing those those play out. But that that was that was the wake up call we had in the past. Now we're we're seeing it play out on a horrible battlefield. The the wake up call to come uh, could be far far worse. I mean, you're also, sorry for jumping in, but you're also seeing, you know, there's been a lot of um, chat about uh, the deployment of HIMARS and then the targeting of logistics hubs. We've been talking about Mad Science were publishing papers on finders versus hiders, what, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, the US Air and Space Power Journal published articles on how we, our, our major m main operating bases were going to be extremely vulnerable and were yeah. not a sensible way to plan for the future. We've known for years that our supply chains couldn't prob probably couldn't produce aircraft at the speed they would need against attrition rates. So now uh, we're using, <laughs> we're seeing that play out in Ukraine, where supply chains are key. So there is so much, you know, that we knew that we planned for, but that was never scaled, was never taken seriously. And I think we have to take a long, hard look at what the barriers are and what, why those things weren't adopted. Because that, you can see all that. You can see again what warfare in the future might look like in some of the other anticipatable contingencies. What lessons aren't we learning now that people like you are writing and publishing in Air Power Review about and making the case for? Okay, Adam, let me bring you in. You talked about a fragility of comms, for example, a little earlier. Is there anything else that you can add on the, the lessons you think that have been learned from the conflict? Sure. Um, I, I, th I think that we're, we're seeing a, a singularity of, of technologies which are going to help support us in the future. And, and, and again, as I mentioned, low Earth orbit satellite technology, um, it's a lot less fragile than anything we've relied on in the past. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's resilient, it's distributed, there are a lot of platforms up there. The platforms are getting better. Uh, there's talk now of, for example, inter-satellite um, uh, laser communications between each satellite. So suddenly you've got a mesh actually in the sky, uh, which means we're even less dependent on using ground-based comms, ground-based fiber uh, to get comms in and out of theatre. And, and this is this is really this is really valuable because uh, if part of this gets damaged, it'll self-heal. Um, I, again, there's there's more there's more platforms up there than than, than could really be attacked very easily. Uh, there are an altitude, which also makes that very very difficult for for any kind of um, counter intel. Um, so so we're, we're starting to see um, that kind of tech be a real enabler. Um, but the other thing, just to go back to to the the sort of the the tech out of theatre, uh, which which is um, the concerted uh, coordination of, of denial of usage of, for example, Google Pay. Apple Pay, TransferWise, PayPal, uh, even Western Union. Suddenly, uh, if you follow the money, um, this, this makes things very, very difficult. On top of that, Swift, uh, again, which runs over the internet. Um, so so we, if we can really start to, to coordinate and look, and look at what is going to slow down, what is going to long term re really intervene, uh, I think that that's something we really need to, to open our eyes to for the future because I don't think anybody actually saw that coming, talking about uh, what Keith was saying earlier about all the technology, AI or whatever, that's, that's suddenly here a lot sooner than we thought it, thought it was. Um, suddenly that ability to, to apply those tech sanctions is because all of this technology that makes life easier is here already. Um, so we have to look at how we leverage that more in future. 
Absolutely. Okay, well, uh, just another question has come through. Um, really kind of generic, I suppose, given the whole of the discussion that we have, but overall, how would you say the Ukraine conflict represents an insight into the hybrid war concept? And we talk about uh, denial of payments, for example. <laughs> I'll try, to, I'll try to answer the question and then, then look ahead, since that's the point of the panel. You know, I think, I think it shows us that a lot of our thinking over the past decade on, on A2AD was correct. That, that on the battlefield, it's the thing between the things that you go after because it's so powerful and enabling. It, it conveys to everything. So if you can hold it at risk, uh, then that's, that's a good strategy. If you also have things that are lower in cost than what you're holding at risk for your opponent, that's a good strategy. Put those two things together, uh, you can really you know, have a, a disproportionate effect. I think Adam's point is a really good one. All right? this, the, this increasing digitization of the world, which most predict is just going to eventually be, become everything. Very similar to how Formula One today, you've got a physical car that's driving on the track, streaming data back to teams of engineers who are analyzing, changing the racing strategy, and redesigning the car, right? That changes on average every 15 minutes in that digital space. It's amazing agility, an amazing example of operationalizing a process. Well, that, that appears like it's going to happen to other industries. It should be happening to militaries, and it's gonna open up vulnerabilities we haven't even thought about today. So I think we'll find solutions in the private sector, and with every solution will come a new problem. And the, the goal of, of everyone in this room is to try to think ahead of those problems by understanding those potential solutions. Okay, well thank you. I am afraid it's all we have time for. It's been a really fascinating discussion, and I'm sure you will be able to continue uh, this chat, this discussion, at breakout opportunities throughout the day. But I'd really uh, like to thank you all, Dr. Keith Deer, Dr. Will Roper, and Professor Adam Beaumont. It's been really fascinating, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.